I need some traction. You need some traction. Ooh. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Um, uh, so we have this panel that was actually misnamed on the write-up. So it's going to be about growth rather than business model disruption. I hope it's okay for everybody. But, you know, I think the two are probably pretty intertwined. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Yeah. So I'm delighted to be here with a great panel we've got together. Immediately to my right is Raul Sood, who is the CEO of Unicorn. And prior to being the CEO of Unicorn, Raul actually <laughs> launched Microsoft Ventures in 2013. And uh, prior to that, he was an entrepreneur that had a company for high-performance gaming machines called Voodoo that he sold to Microsoft. And now he's the HP. CEO. Uh, to HP, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's okay. They all get, I always get mixed up. Yeah, no, no. HP is just... A HP, so yeah. just, sorry about that. No, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> And uh, next to Raul, we have David Barrett, who's the founder and CEO of Expensify. And David, since he was six years old, he always had the vision of becoming an expense magnet. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's either that or I just wanted to get into it for the chicks. So, <laughs> so, he's, um, so he's the founder of Expensify. And prior to doing uh, Expensify, he wrote peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing software that he ended up selling to Akamai. And he left Akamai to start Expensify. And last but not least, we have Andrew Reed, who is the president and founder of Vision Critical, a Vancouver-based company. And Vision Critical, as many of you know, is a $100 million-plus company that employs over 600 and some odd people. And they have a cloud software platform that enables organizations to interact, uh, to get feedback, real-time feedback and insights from their customers. So we're going to talk about growth and um, as we get to each of you, you can briefly tell us what your companies do. And uh, the very first question I wanted to throw out there is about the stages of growth. Uh, all of you are at different stages in your growth uh, trajectory as companies. And I'd like to kind of get you to think about when you look back, either at your companies or your experiences with other companies, were there stages or bands of growth? And were there things that worked at one stage in the company's evolution that didn't work at another company's evolution? And if you could comment about that, because we always talk about growth, but uh, love to hear what comes with growth. So Raul, maybe, uh, David, maybe we can go with you. Sure, I was just thinking actually while you were saying that. So one of my, uh, uh, my director of engineering, Matt, uh, he comments on uh, as, the, sort of, as the company grows and shifts, like what works at one scale just doesn't work as well as the next. And so he describes it. It's like uh, kind of like a video game where you start off and it's like first you're just kind of running around, you figure out how to move, and it's like, oh, that's pretty cool. But then you got to start jumping. And it's like, you still need to run, but now you need to start jumping too. And it's like, okay. And then you get this gun. It's like, okay, you're running, now you're jumping at the gun. Like you're always learning some new tricks. And the old tricks, you know, you keep using them, but you always had to add new tricks to it. And I'd say that uh, I can't think of anything specific uh, other than it. I think it's important to always be open to reassessing what has worked in the past and trying something new. And it's like this continuous gradient as opposed to like a series of distinct stages in my mind. Andrew, what do you think? You, you, you can look back the furthest, I guess. Yeah. I, I, when I play video games, I'm still the guy that kind of like guides the, the <laughs> controller around. So I'm, I'm a bad example. Uh, yeah, I started the company in 2000. We're in the customer intelligence business. We develop software for managing private online communities of customers for big brands. And uh, it took us a while to actually find, our, find the product. We started the company as, uh, as, a, as a professional services company, building kind of everything and anything that was in a domain I felt comfortable with, we would say yes to. And about two years in, we found the product. And, and, and the journey from, uh, from zero to about five million was sort of kind of fake it till you make it. I mean, we'd sit down and promise the world to people. You get that client, and then you'd stress out and figure out how to build those features. Uh, and there was a presentation earlier today talking about how you have to be a slave to that key client. I mean, ours was Air Miles, and Air Miles would call, and they like own my ass. Every time oh, they God, called, you that. were like, okay, whatever you need, sir, no problem. <laughs> and you're like dreaming for the day that you can fire that client, because when you get to the point where you're not relying on that one client, yeah, is important. Um, and, but, but that one client was so key to us. It was a reference client. It was a client that we really needed. And... Um, one day someone came into my office that, that I, I respected that was mentoring and he drove me sort of two lines that went up. And one was, 
um, the story that you tell to your customer, your prospect, and the other one was what your product does. And they weren't you know, side by side, the product always lagged a bit. And he said, you don't want those lines to ever intersect. And for a long time, I think that was true. When we, we're a bigger company now, we have to make sure our product does what we say it does. And we do not let our salespeople oversell anything. Those who are in the audience know that. Um, so for us, it uh, definitely has been a bit of a journey. Raul, you've been on both sides seeing companies from both your company as well as, well as an investor. Can you share with us some of your perspectives? Yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, the one thing I'm going to say is uh, I, I always get comments about our brand, you know, oh, that brand looks great. And they're talking about our logo, you know, more than anything else. And I, and I, I sort of get a little bit bothered by that because, because a brand isn't the logo you put on a T-shirt. It's, it's, uh, it's really the, the foundation that is built. Uh, it, it's, it's sort of um, if, if you're building a company, uh, you build a great product, you have a great fan base or a community. Uh, and you have a really, really great team with a strong culture. And, and those three things become the sort of foundation of, of your brand. And, and your brand, you know, the soul of your company is, is your brand. And I guess, I guess what I'm saying is um, when the founder leaves, that soul tends to disappear over time. And it gets, it gets worse and worse over time. So if you look at HP as an example, you know, Bill and Dave have to be rolling in their graves when they see what happened with HP, <laughs> right? Um, but you look at Microsoft, because you know, HP's had successive CEOs are, are, um, and leadership teams that have completely destroyed this, this Silicon Valley icon, and they're trying to rebuild it, but oh my god, it's not HP. But if you look at Microsoft as an, another example, you've got a living founder who's dedicated his life to making the world better. He's still alive. It's still his, 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 uh, his giving sort of mentality has transcended throughout the organization. And you've only had three CEOs in this company, and they don't, stay, they don't sort of stray too far away from the founder. So I guess you know, it, the founder of the company has to really set that sort of tone and constantly go back to that, like what made us who we are. And you have to sort of make that resonate throughout your team. Thank you. Uh, along those lines, uh, one of the things I wanted to kind of get uh, your input on is culture. We all talk about growth. We all talk about how companies grow rapidly. And, and some of it has been in the news that some of the most rapid, fastest growing companies ever have created a culture that's been toxic. And that culture ultimately has resulted in the company falling from grace, so to speak. Um, you know, maybe we can start with you, Raul, of how do you, what do you do to maintain culture as you grow, as you grow both in terms of revenue, people, customers, et cetera? Uh, it's, a really, it's a really hard question. I mean, we're, look, That's why my, I asked it. yeah, so, so <laughs> That's why I asked you know, it. my company, uh, we, we sit at the intersection of esports, uh, so basically video games and sports, and gambling. You know, I mean, it's, it's kind of like uh, peanut butter and chocolate. You know, uh, uh, I'm a video game guy, I've been gaming all my life. My partner is a gambler, he's a habitual gambler, he grew up in Australia. <laughs> And, um, and we got together and said, wow, this is such a cool idea. Let's go do it. And, uh, and, we, and we did it. We built this company. We, we raised $10 million. We have some, some great investors. But we have a team that sort of spans all over the place. We have, we have people from Australia, from Germany, from you know, uh, Seattle. And, and, and of course, they're all, they're all uh, different cultures. Um, I think it's, it's, it's obviously important to have fun. Um, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's important to sort of set a tone that you want to be proud of so that when you, when you walk away or, or you know, when, you, when you know you're not there, people inside the company are sort of a living, breathing example of, of the culture, right? Um, so you know, uh, just, just, just to be clear, everybody in our team plays video games. And, and we, play, you know, we sometimes play till the wee hours of the night. Um, and, and many of us like to bet. You know, we'll, we'll put 20 bucks on the Seahawks. Um, that's just something we do. And it's just, you know, it's just part of what uh, we do. Awesome. Uh, Andrew, your company has over 600 employees. And you've grown from zero here in Vancouver. Uh, tell us about that. How do, you, how do you deal with that in your company when you're at that scale? Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, we just uh, divested our services business. So we had over 800 employees a few weeks ago. And uh, in the early days, it's easy because you can visually see everyone. And uh, Friday beers means a lot more than Friday beers. We have beer carts and all those things that tech companies are supposed to have. And it took us a long time to realize that we had sort of fallen out of touch with really articulating what our values were. And, and if I could do it all over again, we would have done that way sooner. Uh, about two and a half years ago, we got very serious about saying, okay, we are going to make 
um, culture a priority. And so for us, that was developing a set of values, a set of cultural beliefs, uh, a true north of where we wanted to take our, our company, and then working really hard to, to support it from the top and have it driven from the bottom. And, and that's one of my key jobs that I have at Vision Critical. I spend about a quarter of my time trying to figure out ways to make sure we're living those values. And it isn't, to what Rahul said, it's like not, it's not about like cool t-shirts and logo wear. It's about really having people bought into what you're doing. I'm a, I'm a big believer of, of mastery focus, of mastery autonomy and sense of purpose. And, and I think those are the drivers that matter for people more than a pay for performance culture or uh, just trying to compete on things like price. David? Yeah, I mean, I, I pretty much agree with that. And I would say, but I think the idea of um, culture being the goal, I don't know if I totally buy that. I would say, like, you can't hire for culture. Because um, I think that everyone who comes, like, they change the culture as well. And so they can, they're, they're matching it to a degree, but they're also influencing it. And I think that um, I would say that uh, keeping culture is uh, incredibly easy in theory, just super hard in practice. Everyone knows how to do it. Um, it's just no one does. And like um, everyone will say, like you know, really great people will be like ten or hundred times more effective than average people. But then everyone just goes hires ten or hundred times more average people. And then they're like, what the fuck happened? Where did, where, where did our culture go? It's like we hire a bunch of idiots. That's what happens. It, it's easy to put together like a Prezi deck that has all of the yeah, yeah. fancy stuff about what your values are about. But I think you can use it as a selection tool, right? Like trying to have something where it's you almost want to. Um, say something that if you don't buy into these principles, then maybe we're not for you. So I, you know. I mean, I would say the, so the, I don't know, I'd be curious to hear what your values are, but I was like, from our hiring perspective, it's like, um, number one, we're looking for people that have great natural talent, the people that have the capability to sort of learn and excel and so forth. Uh, and then number two is deep humility. So if you take like the, the, the world of everyone who can do the job, mm -hmm. and then you take just the talented people, so that's a pretty small list, and you take the this intersection of that with like the humble group, it's like this non-existent really group. Small, yeah. It's incredibly small. And then, but beyond that, you just can't filter anymore. And so it's like, we don't filter for like, do you like beer, do you have a particular religion, what that do, is. But do you do anything so that when you're five times the size that you are, you maintain that discipline you instill that discipline, and in the periods of rapid growth, you maintain that standard as you're growing, as your board is pounding on you to grow, 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 grow. The board is an interesting example. I think probably the, more, the most important thing for uh, maintaining control is protecting yourself from the board's influence. And it's like, um, because the board doesn't, doesn't work for you. They've yeah, got a you whole bunch of stuff. They just don't show up to board meetings. So yeah, that's yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's the easiest way, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the main thing is just hire. It's like, really focus on the hiring. And then, like, focus even more on the hiring. Make sure you have just the right people. And then, after you've gotten the hiring down, focus on firing. Focus on t getting, cutting all the people who aren't fitting. And, like, and actually just keep doing that again and again. And I would say it's like, uh, uh, and if you just do that, eventually you end up with a group of people who are incredible. But I think that you can't be like, I'm um, just steering for like, I want a group of incredible people. Like that's just too nebulous. I think you can say, it's like, here are the people who I can actually find and I'm going to uh, pay attention to who's not working out and make the hard decisions to cut them. Okay. Let me change uh, topics on you and talk, come, come back to when you think about growth and you think about growing in the, with your primary product and your primary market and defining your core and kind of going beyond the core, either new products in the same market or, pro, or going after an adjacent market. I like to understand from you when you look at it as a growth company, how do you evaluate the fact that, what are the metrics? Are there any rules of thumb you like to apply to say this is something we're gonna go after and when you have it, when you make the investment, how long are you going to give it? And are you more patient than you were at your earlier stages of development or less patient? Um, it's a multi-part question, but I think as you grow, it becomes really relevant of what you do next and what you don't do next. We, I, like, I like your perspective, all of you. And do, you, do you ever kill your own babies we, and products? We, we, that's, because, what say, that's what we did. We, because we, we, that's what you have to do. We failed at that a little bit, and, and, it's, and we're proud of it. In 2012, we killed three products that all had revenue streams, that all uh, logically made sense. But we said to ourselves, like, are we stretching ourselves too thin? If we're selling this product, we, and, and you can convince yourself that that's an extension, and that's this aspirational buyer, or that you know, you're trying to kind of bet on the future, and, and we decided it made more sense to kill those products and find one thing and do the best we could at one product. Um, and that, that was really hard to do. But And celebrating that, 
that was in 2012, was something that we did, and, and, and for us, it, it made a lot of sense, and now we're getting ready to start to launch more products and to really move with an ecosystem play. Um, but for us, it was all about focus. We, I was saying in the, in the back that we have uh, this hashtag at our company that we're rolling out called hashtag FU, um, and it's hashtag focus and urgency because it's all about trying to be as focused as possible. Cool. Raul, you want to comment? Yeah, I mean, um, I'll just give a comment from, from my past. Uh, you know, I had a, a company that I started in Calgary. Uh, it was a high-end PC company called Voodoo. And, and uh, you know, the company was started with the premise that we love to play video games and we wanted to create the best PC in the world to play games on. I mean, it was, it was really stupid. Um, <laughs> Very straightforward, but, you mean. Yeah, it was straightforward. <laughs> but, but, you know, over time, we found that we were doing all sorts of things. We were doing high-end workstations. We were helping build, like, you know, fast networks. We were doing uh, a bunch of stuff that basically took us away from that, that original focus. So, so one day, we cut literally half of our revenue uh, and said like enough is enough we're going to cut all this stuff I don't care about anything else and we're going to focus go really deep on gaming and the company just exploded we built a global brand and that's exactly how we ended up you know uh, uh, being acquired by HP in Palo Alto but um, but you know it's it really is focus and I, I imagine many of the people in here are are sort of not at that stage yet they're still may, maybe early stage and and they're trying to figure out you know what to go do I, I will tell you this uh, if you're an if you're an early stage company, um, you know, and you've, you've raised a little bit of money or you're looking to raise money, um, you really need to find that one focus and just go nail it. Uh, you know, that, that one scenario that you can, you can do really, really well at and excel at and go deep. And, uh, and then you can sort of scale your business from there, but yeah. Uh, we have a very short period of time, so I'm gonna pass it on to uh, David for his comments. Well, yeah. I would say, I don't know, like, um, when people talk about focus, invariably they think about data and metrics and basically like measuring what's working, what isn't working. I kind of think that's bullshit. And I think that um, like data, I think is incredibly overrated to probably anyone in this room. Like it becomes good for like incremental changes down the road when you get to a later scale. But when you're starting, it's like uh, there's a big difference between data and statistically relevant data. And it's like basically when you're small, all you have is anecdotal data, which is fine, but you can't pretend it's statistically relevant. And so you have to be willing to recognize that what you know or like by the time you have data, that means you've actually waited too long. You should have bet in your instincts a long time ago. And so I think that um, when it comes to focus, it's less about focusing on like what the data is telling you right, but what you just feel is right, what you just want to be right. And then focusing really hard on ignoring all of the data, the that the contrarian sort of views that have come out there. So I agree with, I agree with the idea of focus, definitely. Uh, but I think the focus is not driven by the sort of objective reality. It's focused on like the reality you want to build. And betting hard on that, it's either going to work or it's not going to work. But nothing is going to work if you don't try. But you just got to try really hard on something that inspires you and just stay focused on that. And, and as you become bigger and you have more, so if you're a startup and you, you have nothing to lose, it's an easier decision than when you have a lot of customers, you have a lot of traction, and you have to kind of part ways with some of the things that are gonna hurt when you part ways with mm -hmm. them. I mean, the, I was hoping kind of, do you have a sense of when you talk about focus, is it, does it become more and more important as you become bigger? I don't know, I think that, um... Uh, I, I think it's coming down to like the, the sort of the soul of the of the business. You should just always do what's inspiring you. And if you're inspired to do exactly one thing, yeah, then do that. Do the hell out of that thing. But if you want to do a whole bunch of stuff, that's cool too. I don't know. I, I think that focus is important, but I wouldn't want to like bet my entire business on one thing. Uh, that's it just because it feels like the data is telling me to, or my board's telling me to, or the, the market's telling me to. It's like do what inspires you. And if that's one thing, great. But if that's a range of things, that's great too. I I, I agree with that. I think. For us, um, if, if you can get your product or your market to a point where you feel like, you know, it's the things are working, it's maturing, you can really start to um, branch out. And and if you have that, if you're lying in bed and staring at the ceiling every night, stressing about where your product's at or where your offering's at, then it's probably time to continue to you know focus until it feels good. I I, I totally agree with that. There's a lot of feel as an entrepreneur. That, that you have that can guide um, where you're at in the early days and, and even in the later days. Thank you, everyone. I think we're out of time. I know you have to run, Raul. So <laughs> thank you again for the great discussion. I think we could continue this discussion for a long time, but we appreciate the, the opportunity. And thanks again. Thanks. Thanks. I need some traction. You need some traction.